Hello, everybody. I am here today with the two publishers of a book that is very near to my heart. It is called Elevator Pitches for God. And we're here today to discuss this book, how it came about, and to hopefully pique your interest in purchasing this book for yourself and your loved ones. So um, I think let's dive right in. I'd love if both Mr. Licht and Mr. Cardos you can each introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, and then we could explore the book. Well, my name is Bruce Licht. I live in Northern California, and uh, I met Ron actually 46 years ago at UCLA. We've been uh, best friends ever since, and uh, it's been just really a pleasure to work with him on this book project. I'm Ron Cardos. Um, I'm originally from LA. Uh, I live up in Northern California also. And uh, well, I've just been ha having a blast working on this project with Bruce. Uh, we started with Bruce, it was, it was almost exactly two years ago, right? The first of Nissan. It, that's when we launched it, the first of Nissan. But you actually had the idea on January 7th, 2022. Right. Right. Wow. And it's been amazing. It's been a crazy journey. It, we've had some wild experiences along the way. I, we really think Hakodesh Baroku, we can tell you a few stories and I can let your listeners decide if, you know, this is just coincidence or just a, or, um, you know, if he's really been watching this project because uh, this has been some weird stuff and we can tell you all about it. Yeah, but, uh, definitely you know, your audience should those also wild know, stories. <laughs> your audience uh, should also know that you are one of the authors that were chosen for this book. And you should be honored. It's amazing. You wrote a terrific essay. I just want to show everybody. There's her essay. Oops, kind of got blurred there. I don't know what happened. One of my is. Yeah, we see it. We see it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, she wrote a great essay. We, I should start by telling everyone this book is an anthology, and what we did is um, we asked a lot of very uh, famous people, not so famous people. Thought leaders, you know, we we were sort of struggling with our own spiritual growth, uh, trying to believe in the Almighty, this not this spiritual invisible play world, this construct that Judaism is, has. And we asked a, a, a rabbi, Wolby, in uh, at torchweb.org in Houston, what he thought. He gave us an amazing answer, and we thought, let's ask a whole bunch of people, and it would really help us. And it would really be cool just to share it with people who are like ourselves, who are Balchuva, who are struggling just to believe and uh, get it straight. I mean, you know, I mean, we can talk about what what led to our journey, but uh, so we went around, and Bruce and I started sending crazy invitations. And the original title of the book was "Proof of God in 500 Words." So we wrote senators, ambassadors, movie stars. I mean, we were just looking up everybody we could, and we said, "We're putting together this book. Try and prove God. We're going to give you one page." 500 words, that's it, prove God. And we got amazing answers. A lot of people said yes. Um, Bruce, why don't you mention some of the uh, authors? Well, we have Ambassador David Friedman, who uh, moved the embassy to Jerusalem. We have uh, the late Senator uh, Joseph Lieberman. His essay on God was uh, probably the last piece of writing that he ever did. So we're just honored to have him in the book. And we have Sarah Blau, we have a uh, famous scientist, Gerald Schroeder, Giants in Space. We have uh, the writer of Friends, um, uh, Jeff Astroff, just so many famous people. Dennis wow. Prager, Alan Dershowitz, um, the Supreme Commander of Na uh, NATO, uh, General Stavridis, or Stavridis I, I can never remember how to say his name. Um, Jeremy England, I mean, you can go down this, Larry, presidential candidate, Larry Elder. I mean, people said yes. And they did this all for free. We didn't ask for, we didn't offer to pay them um, a dime on it. Great rabbis. We have amazing rabbis for, for your audience out there. Um, uh, uh, rabbis in the Chabad who write, who, 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 are, who are compilers of Hum, uh, Humash and uh, Perky Avot, um, uh, Rabbi Marcus. He did Haggadah. He just uh, finished Ashish Chayel, the book of, um, um, you know, uh, the, the woman of, of valor. We have uh, from, where's Sameach? We have uh, Rabbi Breidowitz. Um, we have, of course, um, uh, the Rabbi uh, 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 Yaakov Wolby from torchweb.org. Manus Friedman. Manus Friedman, Rabbi uh, Manus Friedman, uh, Sh uh, Shmuel Marcus, um, um, who's Eighth Day. You guys probably are familiar with the band Eighth Day. Yeah, we, wanted to go, we wanted to go to people of different religions and 
as many different varied backgrounds as we could to try and uh, get their different perspectives. And we were hoping that they would bring part of their life experiences into their essays. And it really provided a lot of variety. Every it's essay. interesting that you call it um, elevator pitches for God. Because an elevator pitch is usually like, you know, a business, a mission statement. How did you come to calling it elevator pitches for God? Well, it goes back to 2018. I was uh, in a, I was traveling through Croatia with a group of strangers. And the last night of our trip, we were sitting around a table and someone asked this gentleman across the table from me, uh, his name was Leonard Jacobs. He said, Lenny, tell me about your religion, Judaism. I know nothing about it. And this gentleman started to speak and what was coming out of his mouth was just amazing. Everything he said just really resonated with my wife and I to the extent that we looked at each other when he was done speaking for about six or seven minutes and just said, wow, that was incredible. Because, you know, Judaism, we're a people, we're a culture, a nation, a scripture, a land, a food. How do you boil it down to like six, seven minutes of, of sentences that really encapsulate it? And this gentleman really did it. And uh, I really wasn't religious at all at the time, but it really made me think, you know, I was, I, I've been a Jew my whole life. I'm in my 60s, and I really can't describe my religion. And then when COVID happened, uh, you know, we all were spending more time at home, and there was this uh, new software program called Zoom where we could all <laughs> take classes and all that. And that really started uh, uh, a period of learning for me where I wanted to learn about my religion. And as I did, I was pulling out sentences and all that, trying to create my, create my own elevator pitch. You know, an elevator pitch, the idea behind it is if you were to get into an elevator, let's say on the 10th floor, and then someone was there that you wanted to sell them on an idea or whatever, you have a very short period of time to convey that because once the door is open, you're all going to leave and go your separate ways. So, you know, in this day, day and age when uh, there's just so much information, you know, it's nice when someone boils it down and really puts a lot of time into every word to make sure that it's really potent and really uh, gets the message across. And that's what we wanted to do. And uh, it's really great. You're happy with the results? Very. You know, we're oh, happy yeah. because we're hearing from uh, people that are just really loving it. People that didn't believe in God. Ron, why don't you tell the story of your uh, father-in-law? My father and I had Dennis, Dennis Prager is one of the authors, and he hit his essay, which is pretty early out of the book. And he said, uh, I believe he goes, I don't, I don't need to read anymore. But then he said, what do I do now? <laughs> so we and need he to write that did not believe in God. No, mm -mm. no, no, I don't think so. Mm -mm. I can say I'm pretty sure he didn't. So our next book, and maybe your listeners will help us uh, compile it, is what next? Give us 500 words of, if you believe in God, what do I need to do? What's what's, And that'll be the next, uh, I think, book. Interesting. I thought you would do more elevator pitches for God, but you're really but we are. in the process. Well, we are. Well, we're going to have a lot of elevator pitches first for those people who are stubborn <laughs> and just to refuse to do it. Bruce is, uh, Bruce is this title, we're doing three volumes. And uh, we've already started working on uh, the second volume. And in fact, today, wow. I think we have our first astronaut, which I'm really excited about. Wow. Wow. Right. And it's so interesting because everybody has their different perspective and we're all coming to one place, one God. There is right. a God. We, we were very surprised because, I don't know, I mean, we really didn't know, first of all, what we were getting into, but they came back completely different. I mean, I think no one really argued the same thing which is incredible i how could how could 70 people argue completely different arguments um i mean even the scientists you think that they would would have come at it from the same angle but they really didn't so it was it was really extraordinary and just uh also adding to what you guys were saying in silicon valley there i don't know if elevator pitches is as ubiquitous in the lexicon of everyone but around here if you're you know if you're trying to pitch your deal to a venture capitalist and you're lucky enough to get in the elevator with him you got two minutes and you got to make your pitch to try and get funding or get his interest to get a follow-up meeting and that's where i think the term came from and we um we know with today's uh, short attention spans people aren't even reading books you can't even donate them anymore so we thought with whatever we do we gotta we gotta we gotta do it really really quick that's the nice thing about the book is you don't have to read it from you know the first page yeah. to the last you can skip around and if one essay doesn't uh, strike you, you turn the page and there's a whole nother perspective. 
Yeah, right? something especially that's if it fabulous. sits on the coffee table like that, you can just open anywhere. Yeah, a friend of mine says that this book is a real conversation starter. He loves to leave it out because it gets yeah. the conversation going. Yeah, I was going to say this is Ari Soccer. He invented the Iron Dome. Was one that was on the team, leading the team. I don't know. Why, it's really not coming in focus here, but anyway, here's a here's a our honest and true uh, rocket scientist who would tell you, wow. and he uh, I don't even think he said it as us. I heard him. I've heard him speak. Um, but you know, this guy, uh, thinks that every time, uh, one of those, uh, Iron Dome makes its contact, it's an absolute miracle. He said, it's so complicated. He said, you could go into all the math behind it. He goes, I, he goes, he's just, uh, was amazed it works every time I'm doing this up now because we're, in and the we just here. had this now with Iran and, and there was what, 300 that were intercepted. Right. So that's, right. that's a miracle. That's yeah. a miracle. <laughs> I think he said in his essay, when, you know, a missile defense system knocks down 90% of the. Uh, targets. Some people see it as, you know, intelligent engineers. Other people see it as, you know, the hand of God. But I think in this most recent case, it knocked down 99%. So it was really quite a miracle. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Wow. God. So I'd love to hear some more of the wild stories. Tell me more about the hand of God in the elevator pitches for God. Well, you know, when we met with Rabbi Wolby uh, uh, originally, we were asking him, you know, how do we talk to these different people? And, you know, what should our invitation say? And one thing he said is, you know, you really have to get important people. Uh, if you could get Rabbi Yitzhak Breidowitz at Or Sameach, that would be unbelievable. I mean, Ron and I really didn't even know who he, who he was at the time, but we looked him up, we did research, and we thought, well, how are we going to get to this giant uh, why would he talk to us? And we came up with a plan. It was like five steps to get to the top. And we were going to write an invitation, have Rabbi Wolby, Rabbi uh, Marcus as, as a part of the project. And we would send it to someone else, get them involved. And then we would send it to this person, try and get them involved. And then we knew that this person was the brother-in-law of this person. And we had five steps to get to the top. But after that meeting, Ron was doing some research and he found this a uh, lecture that Rabbi Breidwitz gave. And part of it was very much on point. And he said, Bruce, why don't we transcribe this lecture and send it to him and see if he wants to uh, write for the book. And Wait, as we mentioned- it, it, Forgive me for interrupting. At that point, the book was called Proof of God in 500 Words. Exactly 500, not 501, not 499. I just want to mention- words, And I transcribed this essay and it was exactly 500 words, not 501. Wow. 49. So I sent it to him. Uh, and I said, I, I, uh, I was lucky that I got his personal email uh, through someone. And I sent it to him. And I said, Rabbi, is this a coincidence? Or is there something else going on here? And he says, the fact that you found an excerpt lecture of mine that is exactly 500 words is an elevator pitch for God in itself. And I'm going to write for your book. So we went right to the top immediately. Wow. Just unbelievable. And there were so many things yeah. like that. The a rabbi uh, that wrote uh, our, one of our two closing remarks was Rabbi Lawrence Kellerman. And Rabbi Lawrence Kellerman actually uh, produced a video called What Exactly Happened at Sinai? And Ron gave this video to me years ago, and it was just unbelievable to the extent that I transcribed that video. And it was, believe it or not, 17 pages long. And I found his email and I sent it to him and I said, you know, Rabbi, you know, this is the video that brought me, you know, to Judaism. Do you think there's any way you could take this and boil it down to an elevator pitch for our book? And he says, you know, Bruce, I've spent my life with words. And in order for me to produce that video, I had to throw out thousands of words. So I just don't see how, how I could ever do that. And over the course of the next 11 months, I counted, we had 17 emails back and forth with him, just talking to him about it. And then all of a sudden, we didn't hear from him from a, for, for a bit. And then uh, I ultimately got an email, and it's, and it's unbelievable. It started out, Bruce, God is on your side. I mean, to receive that from Rabbi Lawrence Kellerman was just unbelievable. And he said, God gave me double pneumonia, which laid me out on my back for weeks, and I was able to get done all these projects that I haven't been able to get to for years. And your elevator pitch is attached. So that wow. was quite amazing. And so I mean, go ahead. Okay. No, I was going to go on to the next question. So if you wanted to finish, you want to finish? Well, there's just, were... there were just so many cases like that. It was, it was unbelievable. We Do have you want to share more? more? 
Sure, we can go on and on. Yeah. So uh, we had a we had to become our own publishing company because if you I learned that if you want to make a a nice book that's color that has well the whole thing is color okay it's very expensive in other words our cost would be what we're charging on Amazon right now okay and it just it just in front of it, it might even be more. So I started doing some research. I knew nothing about publishing. I'd never done this before. I just knew the publishers. And if you get a publisher, it's like winning the lottery. If they do it, they don't pay you anything to do it. I mean, they pay you like, I don't know, a buck or two a book or wouldn't even cover our costs we put into this. So so I started learning about it and I thought, okay, I just looked on the internet. I found, you know, some printers, but I called a print broker. And these are the guys who you would hire if you're printing, you know, 10 billion copies. And they know all the printers in the world. They print in, you know, in Vietnam, Vietnam, South, in South Korea, in Turkey. They go, everywhere in China. And I called this guy, I go, I go, um, who's the very best print in the world? Because we wanted this to be a Kiddush Hashem, the best book, the best paper, the heaviest weight. We wanted everything just to, how could we not make it the best, right? He goes, well, he goes, you know, there's this little tiny, uh, you know, there's a place in Shanghai with woman-owned business. Her quality is so high. I don't even fly anyone out there to check her quality. I mean, she is great. I go, really? Who is it? He said, it's Kin Printing. I said, that's funny, because that's the one I had chosen before I called you. No way. Wow. All the pruners in the world. I don't know how many there are. It's, I, how do you get you, there? How do you get to them? Uh, yeah, I just by chance, the one I clicked on on the Internet of all the thousands of them was this, can, you know. Wow. Uh, and the other, the other thing happened with when we were looking for layout people and we have a beautiful layout. There's greatest everyone, even Prager, you know, commented on the Julie Hart on the on the show with Dennis uh Prager and Julie Harmon have a show together on YouTube. He goes, tell them about how the book looks because it really has, It's I don't know why it's blurring. It's must be my my advanced uh, thing, but it's really gorgeous, has gradients. The colors are beautiful there. Here's is better. Yeah, it's and, really beautiful. Uh, um, we got a, a recommendation to get a layout person. They're the, they're the people responsible for putting the fonts, the color, the look, and all that kind of stuff in this book. 30 years in the business, we use this guy two, two days after we hire him. He's in a bad uh, bike accident and he, like, his eye was, he didn't, he's lucky he didn't lose his eyes. So he's out. So Bruce and I go and we, um, we find another guy who's very enthusiastic and he does it. We say, great, you got the job. We make, give him some money to do it. Two days later, he has a heart, heart, heart attack. Oh my gosh. So then I look at Bruce, I go, Bruce, come on, stop. Time, okay, time out. <laughs> That's it. What are we doing wrong here? So we we kind of analyzed what we were doing in terms of picking people and thought, what do you think he wants? I don't know. So we figured we'd hire someone in Israel <laughs> for sure, and uh, you know find find a nice Jewish girl in Israel. And we did, and uh, Shani did it. And thank God I, we, we didn't tell her any of this. In fact, she's probably going to watch this at some point. We, <laughs> pro we probably should have warned her, but no problems. And she did a magnificent job. I mean, it came back, and I just. You know, we 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 arrange stuff a little bit here and there, but it, the, her layout and her fonts, her colors, it, it's just gorgeous. And I and I think um, that's one of the reasons it's really really well received. Why don't you mention uh, the story about Andy? Go ahead. Oh, Andy. okay, I'll do this one. <clears throat> so all of this art, we 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 contact, we look at all this art. We thought, let's make this a beautiful book. Let's put some beautiful art in it. Let's feature. I don't know if you can see, but we have these gorgeous orbs with their blue. It's all being blurred, but you can show it to my ears. There you go. Yeah. And we thought, let's just make this a really cool book so you could put it on your, it's it just physically attractive. And so we, we can't, we looked at all this art and we found one. Um, and uh, she did, she was doing uh, airports in Germany. Her name's Andy Arnovitz. Um, we wrote her and, and she said, you guys, I love your project. I'll do everything for free. You can have all my stuff for free. We were like, Oh, amazing. She's what a sweet, what a sweetheart. So we, we put all the, we put her art throughout the entire book. So, Fast forward to the book launch. We get the books. They arrive in. I'm really uh, excited. I go to my Torah schmooze on Friday afternoon with all my my uh, friends and my uh, my local Chabad, and I I I I, I you know give them all a copy of the book. You know, there were, a lot of them were authors and a lot of them were ambassadors for us. And one of the guys looks at it. He goes, um, "You know, I own that oil painting." I said, "Come again." He goes, yeah, that's my oil painting. It's in my house. I go, wow. well, wait a minute. Of all the artists in the world, we chose one. And of all of her art, she has a lot of art. We only chose you know, 10 or 12. You're telling me that th this guy sits next to me in shul. He's Which like Chabad? Bruce. Where is this? Uh, San Mateo, North uh, Chabad NP. Of oh. all the people in the world, 
he has this in his house. Wow. You know, you tell me, I don't know what the odds are on that, but. So I'm curious what this process has done for your own beliefs and strengthening your own faith in God. Well, it hasn't hurt. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely uh, strengthened mine. You know, this has really been a process. In fact, when we uh, were talking to Rabbi Wolby about this at the beginning, he said, don't worry about um, what this does for anybody else. Worry about or what this book will do for anybody else. Worry about what this will do for you. And it has been just an incredible journey. You know, we've had to uh, learn a lot along the way. I mean, looking at all these uh, essays and uh, one person that uh, wrote for us, his name is Bruno Bolton Lago Paleo. He's actually a logician uh, from uh, Vienna, and um, he wrote an ontological proof. We actually had to look up what an ontological proof was, but uh, it's been a huge uh, growing process, and it's not done. We're not done yet. Not done. Yeah, I think, I'd love to I think... hear more impact stories of people that have already gotten their hands on it and what it's done for them. Okay, so my my dear friend Seth Skutsky, he was one of the first to uh, get the book, and he walked in on Shabbos, and um, and I I didn't know what kind of reaction I was going to get. You know, this was we we had no reaction at the time, and he walks in, and he's um, he's a trust lawyer in San Francisco. He's a a big time trust lawyer. I think as he tells me, I think he only handles cases like a billion dollars or something like that. And um, he's really really well respected in our community. He said, Ron, that book's a triumph. That's how he put it. He said, I can't believe it. He goes, he, in fact, he wrote a great review on Amazon. If you see a Seth, uh, that's him. Um, and uh, for coming from him, it, it really meant quite a, quite a bit. I was really, um, really uh, quite uh, gratified that he thought, if he thought it was great, I, I knew that we, we had something going. What were some know. challenges along the way? <laughs> well, let's see. Bruce and I... Uh, <laughs> To make, you know, when you make something great, everyone wants his idea of what makes it great. And Bruce is a real stickler, real perfectionist, which makes it good. It also drives his uh, his uh, his partner crazy at times. I remember one weekend, we, I, I was really upset over one word, two letters, the word if it was on Kellerman's essay. And Bruce insisted that he either added or subtracted. You know how it is when you fight about something. I don't even remember what it was. But I wouldn't call him until Monday until I cooled down because I thought we should leave. If Kellerman put if in it, we're going to keep if. Anyway, by Monday, I'd cool down and figure this in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to make any difference. So I, 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 I let it ride. That um, should be the biggest challenge we had. <laughs> you know, here, Ron and I, I mean, we'd never done anything like this before. And, you know, how are we going to get these real famous people to talk to us? Right. You know? And then, so we had to do tremendous amount of research to, you know, we would Google who are the you know, 10 people who have changed the world the most, who are the 10 most famous mathematicians, who are the, you know, most famous this or famous that. And then, you know, we had, after we decided, oh, this is someone we would want to contact. Well, then you have to try and find an email address for them. And that's very difficult to do. You know, we would pay for services where we would get emails, but I know one case like my Balak, we emailed her and I guess we, you know, you get the people that are surrounding them you know, and uh, her person said, uh, you know, she's not interested. Thank you. So then we found another name that we thought might be connected to her. And uh, we emailed that person. We, again, we got a, 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 a negative response. And then we found a relative of hers who actually approached her. And we also got a negative response. And finally, through one of our authors, uh, Rabbi Raphael Shore, he actually talked to my Balak's attorney and we finally got a yes. So it took us four times. Ah, you didn't it. give up. You yes, didn't and, give up. And, and and that's what we did with a lot of people because you never know if your email is going into their spam and they're never seen it. And just mm -hmm. because someone turns us away, it doesn't mean that uh, they even heard about it. Like for volume two, I'm sure you're familiar with who uh, the rapper is, Neeson Black. Mm -hmm. We tried to get him very hard for volume one, and we just couldn't really get past his people. But uh, just recently, he put on a concert, and uh, we paid for a VIP ticket because we knew there was a meet and greet. And uh, we had a copy of the book, and we showed him the book, and he knew a lot of people that were in it. And he said he would write for volume two. So here oh, wow. was a place where the person 
said no. I don't even know if he he knew about it, but that we got a no, and ultimately we got a yes. Yeah, so we yeah. just so interesting. We my that. grandfather, my grandfather was a math professor, um, first in university in Russia, and then when he moved to Israel, he was one of the few Hasidic. You know, he had a beard, everything in university in Israel, um, in Beersheba, but actually. You know, there was a core group of religious scientists, mathematicians, and the Rebbe very much encouraged them to get together and do this type of work, write about the proof of existence of God, write about Torah concepts, because for some people, whether they have no background or they're secular, you know, they see the PhD and they're like, oh, if he could believe it, it made so much more room for more people to believe. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that's what I love. You know, your book really had that mix. You have the rabbis, the rabbitons, um, and then, you know, the the science, the artists, the actresses, everything to give their perspective. It's so, so fascinating. We have Jews, yeah. we have Muslims, we have uh, Christians, Catholics. Which really, if you think about it, like it, it's messianic almost. The concept of what's what's the redemption, what's Mashiach? that the whole world will know God. And what you're doing is is bringing that closer. You're getting more people to know God, to believe in one God. It's really well, amazing. I mean, this, the, you know, suicide is a, it's one of the main killers of men, white men right now in the United States. I didn't know if you knew that. And our, and our, and our average uh, longevity is dropping quite quickly. And people have, uh, I heard like a great number of depressed. In England, they actually have a minister of happiness, but it's actually a minister of unhappiness. There's so many people unhappy in Britain that they actually have a minister in their cabinet for that. So, you know, Bruce and I identified that, well, wait a minute, Let, we have to, we, we, you know, obviously as Jews, we have we, our job, I think our job is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, you can email me, um, is to spread the no hide laws and to be an example. Okay. To, and so, but Bruce and I thought, well, wait, before you can do that, People have to believe that there is an intelligent design, intelligent creation. You know, let's start, let's start there, and then we can lead them down to the next thing, which we hope to do in hopefully future volumes. So, in establishing that, we had to get, in a sense, proof. And again, we call it elevator pitches, not proof, because proof is a little heavy-handed. But at the same time, um, uh, it, it's it's really important to. This is the most important question there is. I mean, if you're not there, and most people, they don't hear the arguments at all. They go through school, especially if they're not, you know, aligned with Chabad or anything like that. They go through secular schools, secular universities. They hear everything about why God doesn't exist and how it's just a bunch of fooey and all that. But they don't hear the arguments. Now, my, the time I heard the first argument was uh, it was Dovid Gottlieb. I remember he had a PDF on my friend's table, and he, he's been proving this for a long time. He has many books, um, Reason to Believe. Um, and he did it. With, it took me two hours to read the PDF. And I was stunned. It's really the Kazari argument. I didn't know there were three million people that hear and saw God at Sinai. I didn't know anything because growing up uh, in a non uh, non uh, observant community, they don't even bring it up. They don't argue it. They don't tell you about Sinai. I don't think I think a lot of uh, non orthodox shuls they don't even believe in uh, the revelation of Sinai themselves. So they don't push it. They don't talk about it. When I realized that, I was like, okay, wait a minute. How do you fake that? How do you fake fooling 3 million people? And that's something Kellerman talks a lot about now is if you were going to make this up, if you were going to fool everybody and say, hey, you know, you could either do it in the future and say it's going to happen in the future, which is kind of ridiculous. It happened now and you just didn't hear about it, but obviously we would have heard about it or it happened in the past. And why in the past, um, if it was completely made up, why it would not have worked. And if you uh, really want to hear his argument, you can go online, uh, but that's wrong. But anyway, Dovid Gottlieb did it. And then we contacted him, but his thing was, he he knows, well, he he's really smart. I think he was a math professor. He's debated people and he knows all the things they're going to say and he has an answer for them. And he, he likes to present that up front. So he's in a sense, pre-answering all the objections he's going to get. And that's how he argues it. It just takes too many pages. So he couldn't do it in one. But he probably has, if he really want to get into a proof, uh, once you read his, it is hard to argue with. And I would recommend anyone who's having trouble with that, pick up any of uh, Dovid Gottlieb's. Uh, he also teaches Zor Sameach, by the way. If you have any, uh, Wait, take any... us back to mental health, though. You were saying that you started off saying about the the lack of happiness. Right. What so, does that have to do with, with right, belief so, in God? 
Yeah, we're in a crisis right now. Crisis, lack of meaning. People don't know what to do. They're they're adopting, you know, all these what we can call them false idols, whatever you want. Whether it's, uh, you know, climate change. I mean, there's a million of them right now. The the PLO, uh, the Hamas thing is uh, becoming. I mean, for these some of these people who have no meaning, this gives them meaning. They go out and they protest. They think they're doing something, even though they have no idea what they're protesting. And so I thought we really need to bring. I mean, since God has left, uh, Americans used to be. I don't know almost 100% church going. And I, I know the number is dropping uh, like a lead balloon right now. And that's bad. That's a bad thing because uh, I think it was uh, Rabbi Steinberg who said that people who don't believe in God don't believe in nothing. They believe in everything. And that's what you're getting right now. You're getting people who believe in everything. And we wanted to stop that and do what Jews are supposed to do, which is teach the Noah Heidel, teach them that there really was a God that appeared to us at Sinai. And uh, there's many other groups no one, no other major religion has made that claim. And to this day, no one who's denied it happened. The Christians, the Buddhists, and the Muslims all agree that this happened. Okay, if this happened, and he gave he gave us this instruction manual, that's a pretty big deal. I, I didn't I was a Jew and I didn't even know this. So there's first, an unbroken chain. We have yeah, and by the way, it only happened how many generations ago was Sinai? Was Moses the Ten Commandments? How many generations ago was that? I used to think it oh, that was so far in the past. Well. Do you know how many generations it was? 133. 133. That's not that long ago. You know, the long oh, yeah. time there's four generations sitting around your Passover table. Yeah, four right at your Passover table. And, you know, what is it, 30 of those? And you're you're back at Sinai. This is a very recent event. So wow. that was kind of that was kind of like our you know, our start of the whole thing. And by the way, I do want to mention one other thing in case I forget, but there's a lot of um uh, speaking of the Chabad, we have Nomi Freeman, her her husband, Zvi Freeman, writes every week when you get those little pamphlets that are on the desk. Uh, um, that's his wife. She is an expert in near-death experiences, and she has interviewed uh, hundreds of people and read thousands of cases, and she writes a very interesting essay. Fascinating. Trust me, trust me on this, folks. It's worth the price of admission just to read her uh, essay. And we have... Um, uh, 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 a lot of other very, very uh, powerful women. Uh, we have Sarah Dukes. Uh, her husband, you got, might recall, passed away. Uh, may his name be a blessing. Uh, she has six kids and he died of COVID. He was only like 30 something years old. Yeah, and she, she's got a lot of uh, notoriety. We have, uh, there's an Israeli journalist in here, uh, uh, Rah uh, Savan Rahav Meyer. We have, a, there's a lot of powerful Jewish uh uh, female Jewish voices in here, which when they came in, were a real contrast to I think a lot of the male voices. And I think in my in my quieter moments, you know, when I'm sitting back, I think they really. Um, we have Idi K. She re runs Base Khana, and you guys, if you're not taking classes in Base Khana, if you're not listening to what Idi K has to say, you're missing out. Um, uh, my wife takes uh, her classes uh, every day, and they're really, really something. And they have a lot of getaways also. And Sarah, your essay is absolutely amazing, and we'd love at some point for you to read it. It would give everybody a really good idea of what's in the book. <laughs> sure. Maybe I'll hug up the courage in a few. I was curious also if you wanted something like flat, like belief there is a God, or you wanted something a little bit deeper, like more than just there is a God, but the unity of God, the oneness of God, like to expand the concept of what it means, only one God. Well, look, we'd like a lot of things. When you have 500 words, <laughs> it's hard enough to sort of make a proof or even attempt at a proof, right? Once you get there, then the step two would be, okay, so if there was a God, what do we know about this God? What's this intelligent design all about? Uh, what did Sinai happen? You know, was there proof of Sinai? Again, uh, Rabbi Kellerman has great proof on that. For me, it was like a stepping stone. And then um, because uh, I didn't have any sort of, I don't know, I just started from a you know completely secular uh, orientation, right? I, I had no idea. But after a while, it's kind of like a puzzle and you fill in a whole bunch of pieces and the data points become so uh, big. There's so many data points that you go, wait a minute. At this point, and then when you hear from the scientists, of course, at this point, there's definitely intelligent design. Okay, was that the God that presented himself at Sinai? Well, when you read all the proofs, it'd say like, it's hard to deny that he was all, you know, with how many people we have in the world? Nine billion, four and a half billion think so. Actually more than that, now I think of the Buddhists. But, um, and so 
it's hard to fool people and tell them otherwise. And if he really gave us this, then we better take this seriously. We can't uh, treat this lightly. This is a very serious question. These are various, it's a very serious issue. So, um, no, it's interesting because there are certain mitzvot, certain commandments that are considered constant mitzvot, like loving God and fearing God. Right. And really, the only way to come to that is by knowing God. Like, what's there to love if I don't know him? What's there to right. fear if I don't know him? Like, in order to be able to fulfill these like thought mitzvahs, I need to know. And, and I need to learn. I need to expand my knowledge of who he is. Who is this? Right. You have to know God first and then you'll love God. Right. right. So I'm going to read mine inside. My essay is called Who? Sometimes I'm grateful for the algorithm. I can Google Northern Lights and suddenly my Facebook feed provides me with a steady stream of breathtaking photos of the Aurora Borealis as he dances across and astounds the northern parts of the world. Watching the stunning streaks and designs that appear across the vast expanse of the sky, I find that it does not feel like an exaggeration to say that the northern lights are my proof of God's existence. I'm an artist. When I see a complex painting with intricate details, my first question is, who's the artist? I would find it ludicrous to hear that the paint just spilled itself and created a masterpiece on its own. And even with the introduction of art created by AI, I want to know who programmed AI? How did this come to be? So the logical question for me is, who created the Northern Lights? Who's orchestrating them? And after following this question again and again, I always end up at the same place, an energy, an outside force, a supreme being is behind it all. I once heard a rabbi say, it takes more faith to believe that the world came from nothing than to believe that some sort of powerful force caused it to be. I agree, and I call that force God. It's almost like there are two approaches. One is that the existence of the world is a given, while God's existence is questionable. But if one concludes that at the core of every created being is an energy, the one energy of the supreme being, one realizes that the world only exists as long as the supreme being wills it into existence which is the second approach, that God's existence is a given and the world's existence is questionable. I don't believe that believing in God comes from a purely intellectual standpoint. I believe that it is an emotional experience too, one that I could feel viscerally. When the sun's bright rays are shining on my face, I again feel that magical question, who made all this? I know God from godliness. And I know it not only in a cerebral fashion, but I experience it with every fiber of my being. I know it from the sense that there's something greater than I am. I know it from my personality flaws and imperfections. I know it from the miracles I've seen in my life when I surrender to God and stop trying to control it all. Admitting that there's a God and that I am not God has brought me so much peace and tranquility that I am convinced that men and women of faith are stronger, not weaker. For just as the algorithm has someone who programmed it, and the Northern Lights have a supreme being orchestrating them, every creating being is as its core. By every created being is united at its core by the energy behind it all. Who? God. That's who. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Hey, when, so when did you? Uh, uh, I mean, did you ever struggle with this yourself, or were you, as a kid did you just get it? Some people are lucky. It's such a good question. I think like when I was like 13, I like wrestled with it, you know, at that young teenage stage, I, I found this book called Four Reasons to Believe. I don't even remember where I found it, maybe in the library of like teen camp I was in. And it was really, really fascinating to me. Um, and what I think though about relationship with God is that it kind of evolves, you know, like a snake sheds its skin. Like, you know, I came to a strong belief as a teenager and then as an adult, a couple of times I've had to shed my old belief and come to a deeper understanding and a more mature understanding. Like even in the words that I wrote, they're cryptic. You know, I don't share what my imperfections are that lead me to say that there's a God. I don't share what the specific miracles that I experience, but they're there. And so I think that life experience, even as a religious girl, my entire life has led me to grapple with. And I think, I think, 
when you have a brain, you grapple with it and you, you want to, this is part of the, the mitzvah of knowing God, who is God? What is God? How do we know God? You know, and, and the difference between faith and knowledge and also knowing where knowledge ends and faith begins. Like this is all part of our journey, you know? Doesn't, doesn't being observant really provide more opportunities for belief? Would you say? A hundred percent, because there's a certain given that we believe in God. Like, it, it, it's not like, am I going to come to it? For me, at least, it was like, how am I going to come to this? Convince myself, there is a God. He created me. He's constantly recreating me. And, and that spills over. You know, you started talking about emotional health, but really, it's the truth. Because the more aware of God's presence I am, the less anxious I am, the more meaning mm-hmm. I have in my life the calmer I am, right? Like when I'm losing it and angry and anxious at that moment, I'm not consciously thinking of God because if I was, I, I, I wouldn't be in that space. Right. And that's one of the many axioms we learn is that everything comes to God, everything, God controls everything. So you shouldn't get angry over it because God did it and there must be something good. Right. It all ends well. This is a reason for this. And that so you, you can't be angry at it. I know Manus Reed discovered this many times, but you can't be angry. You shouldn't be angry with anything. It's like, well, it's a challenge or whatever it happens that's uh, annoying you or whatever it is. It's uh, yeah, so make you careful. Yeah. Right. So one of my favorite things, and I this is a little bit off 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 the uh, topic, but I love it when it when uh, in the in the in the Bible for the uh, the first five books of Moses, we call it the Chumash. Um uh, uh, non-Jews call it the Old Testament, although the New Testament is pretty old too. So we should really call it the most recent Testament. Um, it says, uh, yeah, only God, Testament, Ron. <laughs> God says, uh, your ways are not my ways. And I love that because that really lines up with what science is, is seeking, which is, well, we know our ways. We know what we've discovered. You left that behind for us. But at the end of the day, we may never be able to understand his ways. And I think quantum mechanics now is diving into that, where every little thing that happens here when you hit the desk, you know, something's vibrating on the other end of the universe. Um, it also ties into Kabbalah beautifully, because uh, Kabbalah believes every time you do a mitzvah, whole worlds are created. Entire worlds, universe. You have my favorite created. joke. One of my favorite jokes about God. <laughs> Go ahead. A bunch of scientists got together. And they're like, look, we've done a lot of good. I think we're pretty advanced. Like we got this God, like we'll, <laughs> you know, we could even clone a person. We could create a person. And they, and God says, really? And they said, yeah, He's like, oh, let's have a little, show us that you could do it. Um, and they're like, yeah, we'll take earth and we'll create man out of earth. And they come to God with their earth and like, okay, we're going to create a person. And God says to him, what does God say to the scientists? Go get your own, your own earth. earth. <laughs> go get your own earth. <laughs> make, make it yourself. Make your own earth. Yeah, right. go make it yourself. Yeah. Um, great joke. Yeah. Mr. Lick, can I ask you a, a question? Yes. That's not directly related, but I was just really curious. You know, in our emails back and forth, I think it was you or um, Mr. Cardos told me that you are legally blind and yet you edited this book. So if you don't mind, I was I, like, how did how did you do that? Well, I have a rare degenerative disease called retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, every day I'm losing a little bit more sight. And unfortunately, there's no cure. So basically, my vision is getting less and less and less and less. And what I can see is getting more and more blurry. But I still can see. I still have sight. I'm not, you know, completely blind. So everything is a little bit harder for me working on the computer and all that, but um, but I can still do it and it's very enjoyable. So uh, it hasn't stopped me. Wow, that's impressive. And I'm, you know, you, you, you're a great editor. You know, you mentioned the word if before, but I remember when with my essay, it was this word, it was that word, there was a capital. First, I was like, wait, what'd you change? I can't see it. And then I was like, oh, it's this, you know, smidgen of a, of a thing. And, you know, you're, you do your job well, so thank you so thank much. You. It was a pleasure working with you, and and uh, I think you you did everything. I remember when you uh, changed that last sentence and said, you know, who God who, you know, to relate to your title, and it it was just, it's just a beautiful essay. Thank you yeah, so much. Any last stories or messages you want to share with our listeners? Um, I would just say buy the book. Uh, I would say leave a. It, you really help us out if you leave a. Um, 
review on Amazon that kicks us up in the rankings. Where can I people say, find your book? Go to Amazon, type in Elevator Pitches for God. It's on audio, it's on Kindle, it's on hardback. Um, you can buy both. Uh, I would really uh, recommend having a hardback. I know no one likes to buy hardbacks anymore, but this is so gorgeous. If you put it on your table, people will pick it up and read one. This is great Shabbos table discussions. Great for kids. You know, have this in your house where these are the arguments that they will have for our God. And we, uh, and as we get to know him, this is the, the gate that opens a rich, beautiful life for us. Like you said, without fear, without anxiety, and with Simca, with joy, this is it. This will help. This will help. You don't, I know parents with kids, it's like, you know, they don't listen to anything you say. <laughs> right. So just leave this around. Maybe they'll read an essay. Maybe they'll read an essay and maybe it'll, it'll, I, I'm sure it'll change a lot of people's lives with it. Elevator pitch for elevator pitches. For God. <laughs> you can also find it at our website. Our website is www.ep, the number four G standing for elevator pitches for God. And that's the website for our nonprofit. We actually created a nonprofit that this book is held by. Our nonprofit is called For Good and For All because we are for good and we're for everybody. So if you go to ep4g.com, you could learn a little bit more about our uh, nonprofit and about the book. And you can also uh, purchase the book there also. Yeah, well, what if somebody wants to contribute to a future, a future volume? Excuse me? What if someone wants to contribute to a future volume of Elevator Pitches for God? There's a donate now button on the website. And that would be very helpful. You know, Ron and I have funded this whole thing ourselves. And uh, we're now starting to get some, some donations in to help. Ron, why don't you mention about the podcast series that we're developing? Right. We are developing a podcast here. It's already funded, uh, uh, like Bruce said, with our money. Uh, it was gonna, it's going to feature Noah Greenfield as our illustrious host. Um, uh, Noah's on the East Coast, and uh, Scott Kahn in Israel will be producing it. Scott Kahn has a great uh, podcast called The Orthodox Conundrum. Very intelligent, uh, very fast-paced. Uh, Scott's an amazing guy, uh, 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 um, and so is Noah. These are both amazing guys, so I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, we hope interviewing our authors. Yeah, they'll start to interview our authors, go through. We have Eliza. By the way, if you guys want to listen to the authors, go to ep4g.com. You can see who's on there. You'll you'll be blown away. Eliza Ben Shalom, the Jewish matchmakers on there. She wrote for the book um, and many others. I know the one, one of the joys I see is when people open the book and they start looking at the authors and they go, oh, I know this person and I know this person. <laughs> get, it's like, oh, I know this person. Name dropping. Oh, yeah. A little something about that. Right. There's another Gosh, Sarah Black. The original, I think we got the originals of everybody. <laughs> we could have some fakes in this book. I don't know if I have never seen them in person. But um, anyway, that's uh, that's it. So uh, anyway, thank you so much for having us on your show. And I um, I wish you nothing but uh, blessings and success. Uh, and uh, and uh, I hope uh, I hope some of you all go out and buy the book. And uh, let us know how you like it. You can email me. If you want to email me, I'm ron at ep4g.com. And uh, Bruce is Bruce at ep4g.com. Uh, we we're, we love comments. We love feedback. If you know someone who wants, who you think will write a great essay, uh, let us know who it is. We really can use the help right now. Um, we have no staff. We're doing this all on our own. So uh, please let us know if you'd like to help with fundraising or anything. We could use a few bucks because we're just, we'd love to see this in every hospice. We'd love to see this in every hospital waiting room. We'd love to see this in every doctor's waiting room. We'd love to see this in every nightstand and every hotel where people are often by themselves and they can really read this. We, couldn't, we could change the entire world, I think, if people get on board. Of course, we'll have to do our next step, which is tell them what does God want from them. But that'll be, that'll be the, the next thing, one thing at a time. Okay. Wish you much success. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us.